Welcome everybody, really delighted to have you join us today uh, for uh, the next uh, session in our series on confronting environmental racism and promoting environmental justice. My name is Amy Schultz. I'm on the faculty here at the University of Michigan School of Public Health and co-lead the MLEAD Community Engagement Corps, which is a co-sponsor for this series along with the Stakeholder Advocacy Board and the Integrated Health Sciences Corps. Of affiliated with the center. I want to begin uh, this session with a land acknowledgement um, to the Anishinaabe, the Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Badawatomi, um, along with their neighbors, the Seneca, Delaware, Shawnee, and Wyandotte nations who cared for and lived on the land from which we are presenting for many generations. We want to acknowledge, re renew, and aff affirm the ancestral and contemporary ties of the An Anishinaabe to this land. And we are grateful to them for the opportunity to present um, this session today. I wanna begin with just a quick um, uh, refresher um, on environmental racism and environmental justice. In the words of Reverend Benjamin Chavez, who was one of the founders of the environmental justice movement, environmental racism is racial discrimination in environmental policymaking. It's racial discrimination in the enforcement of regulations and law. It is racial discrimination in the deliberate targeting of communities of color for toxic waste disposal and the siting of polluting industries. It is racial discrimination in the official sanctioning of life-threatening presence of poisons and pollutants in communities of color. And it is racial discrimination in the history of excluding people of color from the mainstream of environmental groups, decision-making boards, commissions, and regulatory bodies. Environmental justice is the movement that has arisen in response to environmental racism um, and is working diligently to address um, the implications of environmental racism that has played out over decades. I'm really delighted that today um, we are able to host as part of our residents and researchers uh, session, community and research perspectives on air quality. Three amazing presenters who are gonna talk with us about their work on air quality um, with a particular focus on Detroit. Really delighted that presenting with us today, we have Timothy Devonch, who is a professor in the School of Public Health, um, and, and additional, joined by panelists, Catherine Savoy, um, who is the D Detroit Community Health Director for the Ecology Center, and Raquel Garcia, who is the Executive Director of Southwest Detroit Environmental Vision. And I am going to turn it over to our panelists um, who are gonna walk us through a lovely presentation today. So Tim, I think you're next. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, it's wonderful to join everyone, to be with you all. Thanks for joining uh, this panel this afternoon. Uh, I'm excited as well. Uh, the topic is uh, fantastic, very important. Um, and I'm looking forward to learning quite a bit. Uh, I wanted to start uh, and actually in the, over the next few minutes accomplish two things, uh, and that's my goal. Uh, one is to give a little bit of background around air pollution and health, and more specifically uh, airborne particulate matter and its impact on health, and then segue a little bit around PM exposure assessment issues in Detroit communities specifically, and where we're at with some limitations around being able to assess exposures uh, to the most vulnerable uh, residents. So when we talk about urban air pollution issues, and this is the case all across uh, the globe, we're focused on two pollutants. One is ozone, which is a gas, which is actually formed in the atmosphere from emissions of other pollutants, mostly nitrogen oxides and volatile organic uh, carbons, volatile organic compounds. Particulate matter, or uh, for short, PM, is another one that we're concerned about in urban areas. Uh, the sources of PM include motor vehicles, incinerators, 
uh, and other sources of high temperature combustion. So why are we concerned about these pollutants in the first place? When we look at the global burden of disease and specifically air pollution and its impact, uh, we see some factors that you might expect, high blood pressure, smoking, et cetera, but you don't get too far down that list just after high total cholesterol where you see ambient particulate matter. Ozone that I mentioned a moment ago is also on this list, but it's a little bit further down. So when we look at all of uh, the morbidity and mortality that comes from exposure to air pollution on a global scale, it's really airborne particulate matter that's the biggest driver. In terms of estimates, uh, it's somewhere, depending on the uncertainty range, somewhere between four and six million premature deaths each year around the globe. And just to put that into a little bit of context, I, the latest numbers I've seen on uh, in terms of COVID related deaths worldwide is a little over 5 million. And that's over, we're not quite to two years into the pandemic now. So we're basically having a pandemic's worth of premature death from air pollution exposure every year. All right, so how does this cause grief? So we have this ambient particulate matter, which are very small particles in the air uh, that we are exposed to when we breathe. Our lungs, our, our upper airways, were actually designed quite well in filtering out large particles. So uh, the, the nose hairs and the mucous membranes you know, through our nasal cavity and throat actually do a pretty good job of removing particles and not allowing them to get into our lower airways. However, these smallest particles, the ones we're really concerned about, are able to evade those upper airway mechanisms and reach deep down into our lungs, where they're able to impact uh, in bronchial tubes and in lung tissue. And the smallest particles are actually even able to be absorbed uh, by the bloodstream in the alveolar region. When we, when we look at all of these morbidities and mortalities from air pollution exposure, and particularly the PM, it's, it's attributed to respiratory uh, outcomes and cardiovascular outcomes. This is where most of the, the data and health outcomes uh, are residing. Here in the US, we regulate air pollution uh, through the US EPA. So the EPA sets air quality standards at the national level, but then the standards are actually implemented and enforced at the state level. There are six national ambient air quality standards, uh, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, which I mentioned, lead, sulfur dioxide gas. But then down here, what's really what we're focusing on today is particulate matter. Uh, both PM10 and PM2.5. Those numbers refer to the size of the particles. So when we say PM2.5, this refers to all particles that are less than two and a half microns in aerodynamic diameter. And importantly, these are the ones that are able to reach deep into our, our lower airways. A little bit of good news. Uh, this is looking at PM 2.5 trends in the US over the last couple of decades. The good news is, is on average, PM 2.5 levels are going down over time. Uh, something on the order of a 43% decrease on average over the last 20 years or so. This has primarily been made uh, through headway on uh, regulating stationary sources. So things like coal-fired power plants, having improved control technology on smokestacks, uh, or actually even you know, decommissioning, closing down uh, sources of, of stationary sources of high temperature combustion. So this is the good news. The, the not as good news is the headway that we've made on a particular type of PM. So over here on the right, we have uh, secondary particles. So these are the ones that I was just speaking of. Uh, when we have a power plant, that's uh, burning coal, sulfur dioxide gas is emitted 
And that SO2 gas actually forms in the atmosphere into sulfate particles. And this is why the term is used to describe them as secondary particles. The particles aren't actually emitted directly from the smokestacks, they're formed downwind. And this historically is why we have kind of regional larger scale PM uh, pollution problems. Primary particles are different in that they are actually directly emitted from a source. They're most commonly emitted uh, from diesel sources. So like diesel trucks within urban areas. And it's these types of sources that over the last 20 years or so, we've not made as much headway in reducing emissions. And so the result is that as a proportion, we have a higher fraction now of PM from these motor vehicle diesel trucks than we used to say 20 years ago, specifically within urban areas. Segwaying a little bit into Detroit area communities. Uh, over that roughly 20 year time period, uh, there are EPA uh, uh, and state level Michigan uh, Department of Environmental Quality, now EGLE, air monitoring sites that are there for, to assess whether the, the national ambient air quality standards are being met or not. Uh, there's stationary fixed sites. There are currently six of them total uh, for the entire city of Detroit. So when researchers do air pollution and health studies, they're reliant on a very small number of monitors uh, to actually assess what the impact is on health. And the problem is, is that they're, they're not the most accurate source uh, of, of a way to assess exposure to PM. And the reason is because there are many uh, mobile sources of Detroit, uh, sources of PM in Detroit. Uh, the Ambassador Bridge here, which connects the city of Detroit with the city of Windsor in Canada, is the largest commercial border crossing between the U.S. and Canada. Huge number of, of diesel trucks uh, traverse the bridge each day and result in a, a large amount of localized traffic in these local neighborhoods. I'm, I'm pointing here on the map specifically to, to southwest Detroit. There's a disproportionate burden here. And there's also a large amount of industry uh, along the Detroit River. Zog Island uh, moving up towards the bridge has uh, coal burning, an oil refinery, um, uh, chemical manufacturing, a lot of stationary sources in addition to these mobile sources. And it's the most vulnerable, uh, the most vulnerable people with regards to air pollution exposure very often include um, communities of color, as well as specific subpopulations. Uh, women, uh, pregnant women, women of childbearing age, children themselves, and the elderly. So ideally, in an ideal world, if we, had, uh, we weren't limited by resources, we would assess exposures at the personal level, having everyone wear a personal exposure monitor so that we weren't reliant upon uh, a stationary monitoring site that's several miles away from where someone lives, that's maybe not capturing all of this localized pollution that they're likely being exposed to. So I'll finish with a slide that highlights uh, some of my most recent um, research interests, which is trying to address uh, this limitation in being able to more accurately assess exposures at the personal level. What has been available off the shelf for the last 20 years or so is uh, large kind of cumbersome um, monitors that are designed for occupational settings where you have, for the most part, younger, healthier workers who wear these for maybe eight hours during a shift as part of their job. When we go out into the real world, into communities and want to measure exposures. And then again, we're looking at uh, low-income residents, women of childbearing age, children themselves, the elderly, pregnant women. Carrying these monitors is quite a burden, um, even if resources were uh, not limited. And so in order to actually uh, uh, gain more accurate information around accessing these exposures, we're not just trying to improve the technology, we're trying to improve the wearability. 
So we were, we were funded. I'm part of a team that was just awarded in September a five-year uh, grant from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The title is down here at the bottom, Wearable Microsystem for Continuous Personalized Aerosol Exposure Assessment. So aerosols, again, being another word for particulate matter. And it's our goal to develop these very small, easily wearable, again, for the most vulnerable uh, subpopulations, to get uh, really accurate information on PM and various size fractions, as well as the chemical components that make up the particles in near real time. And our hope is that this is gonna help to uh, improve not only exposure assessment, but give us a much better understanding of both the spatial variability of pollutants across communities, as well as how they change over time. And speaking of time, I think mine is up and I'm gonna hand things back over to Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And actually, I think we'll go directly to Catherine. And when Catherine is finished, we can go directly to Raquel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And uh, thank you uh, to all the sponsors of today's um, seminar and also to everyone who's attending. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with you today. Um, most of my work at the Ecology Center involves working for clean air these days. Um, but I also am a resident of Southwest Detroit and the area that you saw just on the map where Dr. Devant showed you uh, where he's working and uh, where a lot of that industry is located. And I'm also the parent of a child who has asthma. So I know firsthand the experience of the impacts of living with poor air quality, um, you know, both in my professional work, but also in my personal life. So I'm very passionate about this and I'm very pleased to speak with you. Um, as you, as we mentioned earlier, was mentioned, um, Southwest Detroit is home to a lot of uh, industry and freeways. Um, the 29 black dots on this map indicate um, the major sources of air pollution that are required to report their emissions to the state. Um, and this area includes um, the state's um, the state's only. Um, uh, oil refinery, um, the largest uh, wastewater treatment plant in the state serving 126 municipalities across Southeast Michigan. We have auto and steel manufacturing, slag, asphalt, and cement plants, an intermodal freight terminal with trucks and trains uh, from all throughout the region. Um, and as was mentioned, the nation's busiest international border crossing with thousands and thousands of trucks a day. And we will soon be home to the new International Bridge, the Gordie Howe Bridge, construction of which is underway and which is planned to open in 2024. So most residents in my community live in close proximity to both industrial and vehicular sources of pollution. And uh, we are living with this cumulative impact of all of these different sources of pollution, which have enormous impacts on our health and quality of life. However, the current permitting system fails to really consider the cumulative impacts of these multiple sources when, when facilities are permitted. Um, and our experience in the community is that monitoring uh, by the state is not adequate uh, to understand what's really going on and that enforcement often fails to hold the polluters accountable. The result is that our air quality regulations and agencies fail pretty miserably to protect us from the cumulative impact of these multiple exposures. I took this photo last week as I went out for a walk. This is a 10th of a mile from my home uh, by Clark Park. And you can see the trucks lined up uh, standing idle um, in a line to get onto the Ambassador Bridge, which is about a quarter of a mile ahead. And you can see the trucks lined up all the way across waiting to get through customs on the other side in Canada. Uh, the, the truck line extends to the right about a mile down the freeway, and this is a really common occurrence which impacts their air quality in the area. Our community is also heavily impacted by air pollution from industrial sources, such as the Marathon Oil Refinery seen here, but we aren't victims. Communities across Detroit are fighting for clean air and environmental justice, and there's a lot of community leadership working to hold polluters accountable, win better policies, and fight for our right to breathe clean air. We use every tool available to us 
we advocate with elected officials, we demonstrate, we use work, work for policy change, and we do community-based research, and we use legal means uh, to fight back for clean air. The Ecology Center, where I work, has a long history of working with Detroit communities for clean air. In 1999 to 2000, one example is that we were part of a large coalition that organized to shut down the Henry Ford Hospital incinerator, uh, which was located in an area that had um, high asthma, even as they were promoting their programs to um, address asthma in the community. And so we were really thrilled about that victory. Um, and more recently, uh, we helped form the Breathe Free Detroit campaign, which was formed in 2017 and in 2019 was successful in shutting down the municipal waste incinerator in Detroit. And I'll say more in a minute about that, how that led to you know, our work for um, clean air monitoring. These are just a few campaigns about clean air, but they're not just about clean air, they're about justice as well. Because we know the impacts of air pollution, like other forms of environmental degradation, are not equitably distributed across the population. Many factors affect a person's exposure to air pollution, including proximity to industrial and vehicular sources, but also historical factors such as redlining and housing segregation, as well as race, class, access to healthcare and the experience of racism in the healthcare system affect the health outcomes one experiences as a result of the exposure. In Detroit, 721 premature deaths annually are attributed to um, air pollution and the majority of that is due to PM 2.5. So the Ecology Center's work on community-based air monitors grew out, as I said, of the Breathe Through Detroit campaign. The incinerator is located or was located in a impacted, uh, uh, sorry, directly impacting um, vulnerable communities in Detroit. In addition, the facility was a bad neighbor with over 750 violations of the Clean Air Act in a just a five year period, including violations for failure to effectively control particulate matter emissions. The Ecology Center worked with residents in the area who were concerned about the particulate emissions and installed several low cost particulate matter sensors to observe what was going on. So we're really excited about this, but the week the, um, we got the, the um, monitors installed, the incinerator announced that they were permanently closing. So we kind of pivoted and began to look at other areas in the, in the community where air pollution was a concern and have established a network of monitors across the city. Oops, sorry, I think I missed. Okay. Um, we see low cost community monitors as a tool to help empower the community. Monitors can be placed at residents' homes and schools and places of business uh, to increase community awareness about air pollution and increase community involvement. They can be used in schools to help kids with learning how to interpret data, and they can uh, support community advocacy um, for, for better uh, clean air. The data can't be used directly for enforcement actions or uh, in permitting, um, but it can help us to document where problems exist or hotspots, where policies are failing us, where the, the regulatory monitors, which are mentioned are very widespread, um, are, are, are missing what's going on, um, and where further monitoring or enforcement action might be needed. So we're using uh, purple air monitors as one of our monitors uh, across the city. And these measure PM 2.5 and PM 10, and they collect and upload data every couple of minutes to a publicly available website. Uh, we have a network of these monitors now across the city. Uh, we have some uh, in Detroit's east side near the Stellantis plant. We're working with community organizations in that neighborhood. Uh, we have some in Southwest Detroit at the Detroit Hispanic, uh, Development Corporation at Chas Clinic and, and at several residences. We have a partnership with the Green Door Initiative in which we've hired uh, and trained uh, um, an air quality technician to help us uh, with the installation and maintenance of the monitors because it ends up being a lot of work to keep all of these monitors running. And um, sorry, I forgot where I was going here. <laughs> So we now have 27 of these uh, purple air monitors uh, in a network across the city. 
And this is the website, thepurpleair.com, where you can see each of the monitors as a dot on the map um, with the air quality index for PM 2.5 displayed in real time. And um, the color of each uh, monitor indicates the, the air quality. So green is good and yellow is not so good and orange is kind of moderate. So this was taken on a kind of moderate air day. And the information on that map is publicly available to anyone to see. So we're using several different types of monitors. I mentioned the purple air. We're also using the Clarity Node S monitor, which measures PM, ozone, and um, NO2. And you can see that on the top of that pole there. Um, it is solar powered and battery operated so that we don't need access to Wi-Fi and electricity the way the purple air monitors do. And we're also using um, the Flume, uh, pl sorry, it says Plum, uh, it should be Plume, Flow2 wearable monitors. Um, and we're really excited about these. Um, Dr. Devanch mentioned, um, you know, using small wearable monitors. These are relatively low cost and very easy to use. You can attach it to your belt and, um, or a backpack and walk or bike through a neighborhood. And using a phone app and your phone's GPS, you can get a readout in a real time of air quality as you move through an area. And you can see my on the right side is a screenshot from my phone of a walk through my neighborhood. And you can see that most of the time the air quality was good or green, um, but there's a few spots, a very, very specific spots where PM 2.5 or PM 10, sorry, was very high. And those are shown uh, in purple. So we're working um, with, sorry, I'm skipping slides here. Yes, we're working, um, gosh, uh, I'm skipping a slide. I don't know what happened here. Oh, yeah. So Detroiters want both um, good jobs and clean air, uh, but we often are having to choose between the two. Um, and we're working with communities on the east side of Detroit, the, the um, justice for Beneteau residents who are concerned about air pollution from the uh, Stellantis plant, the automotive paint shop. And we're using these uh, flow two monitors um, as well as uh, the purple air monitors to get a sense of what is going on and to empower communities to collect data about what's happening because there are several violations of VOC or volatile organic compound emissions from that plant currently. And we're supporting the community um, and using monitors as an advocacy tool. We're also conducting workshops with communities across uh, the city. Uh, this is a workshop in Southwest Detroit in the 48217 zip code uh, pre-pandemic. Um, this is a uh, post pandemic. We've moved to outdoors in the community garden, socially distanced and masked, but we're still continuing the work. And we've also attended uh, community health fairs uh, to help people understand air quality issues and how we use monitors. And we work with uh, groups in Hamtramck with uh, high school students uh, at the high school, as well as the Detroit Hamtramck Coalition to use the flume. Um, the plume flow two monitors to collect uh, data about air quality in that community as well. We've been working with Southwest Detroit Environmental Vision and others in Southwest Detroit. Um, there's a truck study and we are using the, the purple air monitor, which you can see on the left and also another one on the right in areas where that are along designated truck routes uh, that the city has proposed and getting a sense of truck numbers. And these are being installed with uh, cameras so that we can also track the number and type of truck uh, that's, and that's uh, passing along these truck routes. Uh, Ecology Center is also uh, the convener of the Detroit Air Sensor Learning Collaborative, uh, community, government agencies, academic institutions coming together, a wide variety of folks that are using monitors for various purposes, including regulatory research, and community and education engagement purposes. Um, and we're sharing um, our experiences, learning from each other, sharing best practices, sharing data, and um, hopefully um, co collaborating our efforts um, across a wide variety of organizations. So I just want to end by saying that um, there is a huge need for community academic partnerships in this work, uh, especially equitable partnerships can provide uh, important support for air quality monitoring for data management, because that's a huge effort as well for mapping the results that we're finding uh, in policy advocacy as well, and um, in developing better models for clean air policies, uh, better models for permitting 
enforcement, health protection, and especially cumulative impact, which seems to get ignored in all of this. So I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about what we're doing, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Catherine. I'm under the weather, so if we give my, <laughs> my voice. Um, Southwest Detroit Environmental Vision is a community-based nonprofit that works with community members, businesses, institutions to protect the environment. We are divided into the land and water and healthy air programs. Um, SDV's projects include Urban Gardens, Clean Diesel Initiative, our Healthy Business Initiative, and Youth Engagement. Um, it's SDV's continued effort to engage the Southwest Detroit community in holding industrial polluters accountable through education, outreach, and mitigation projects. I'm going to repeat some of the same information that I think we both, um, uh, Tim and Catherine, covered. Um, uh, Southwest is Detroit is a, a frontline community at the third busiest port in North America, averaging 10,000 trucks a day. Um, and uh, and I, I just sort of take that in because if you don't live here, if you are not directly affected, um, you, don't, uh, you don't know how it's normalized um, to have trucks on both sides of you, behind you, honking at midnight. Um, it's, it's, a, it's very surreal and normalized. Um, and so it's a different existence here in the neighborhood. Um, we have the second bridge, Gordy Howe, um, coming up uh, in 2024. It's in construction now, and we think it'll double, if not um, to another 10,000 trucks um, in 2024. Um, so it's um, not just Southwest Detroit, it's South Dearborn, um, neighborhoods like Del Rey, 48217, Melvindale, and River Rouge. Um, it's all the plants that Catherine talked about. It, it extends along the water. It's it's um, the corridor. Um, we also have uh, pollution. We're uh, affected by pollution from the uh, Port of Detroit, trains from the Detroit Intermodal Freight Terminal, truck traffic, 24-hour industrial noise. Um, and that they sound like explosions. It's when they drop the metal containers onto the beds. So it's metal on metal at midnight. And so you're just sort of jolted out of bed. Um, so we have diesel emissions, fugitive dust um, from storage and other things that they transport, um, water body health, because that flows into the river, um, all here in this, in this region. Uh, there are also incidents, like Catherine mentioned, um, like a recent border um, agent strike that caused trucks to back up for four to five miles. I mean, all the way down um, to, uh, I think it was uh, past, past Melvindale, um, idling for more than eight hours. Um, so we see this long train and it goes up 75 and it goes around 94 um, and it blocks all the traffic around 96. Um, so all that being said, Southwest Detroit is home to six of the top 10 most polluted zip codes in the state. Um, and with all that, we're also the most diverse, densely populated area of the city with a vibrant local economy um, and um, with first and second generation immigrants. So there's, a, there's um, other languages spoken here, Spanish and Arabic. District six um, alone is more than 176,000 people with 51% of those being under the age of 18. So not only do we have this language barrier sometimes, or I would say language plus, um, it's, it's a good thing to speak other languages, um, but you have minor, um, minor children who cannot advocate for themselves, um, who you know, are being subjected to these conditions. Um, along with that, um, the Detroit median income is $25,700. Um, so we see all of these sort of uh, perfect storm conditions, um, um, you know, just happening all at once. Um, since I came to Detroit, I'm here as, as a resident as well. Um, and J Catherine, jump in if you have information. There has been at least six planning studies, um, not only citywide, but also in Southwest Detroit, on top of each other. Um, at least a dozen industrial permit applications that uh, come, get rejected, come back, and just back and forth. Um, and these events come very quickly at residents. Um, residents uh, that don't have the scientific training to to learn quickly what these permits are, what they're going to do in the future, how they will affect not, like traffic, right? So 
what is what it means uh, for the street, but what it means for your lungs. So it, it, it happens very quickly. Um, there's a lot of assumptions made by planners um, in the city of Detroit um, Building and Safety Division, which approves and denies these permits. Um, in the case of some of the permits, um, the city only has to notify within 500 feet of the plant. Many times those 500 feet are just, it's concrete. So there's not a lot of people who will receive this notification. So these things can come and go without, without notice. And it's um, a, a, a bad barrier for us because we know that even though you don't live within 500 feet, that air and emissions and dust um, travel much more than those 500 feet. So, um, so, with all of that, you know, um, we we want to advocate for you know the data, the research, the partnerships that will help us understand these permits, this potential um, uh, environmental you know impact on on families. And so, I just had a, a list of bullet points of things I wanted to share with you um, as as researchers and 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 folks helping assisting residents um, collect the information so that they can advocate with the city and the state and other entities. Um, so residents need data to make help their arguments to be included in the research, to participate in the data gathering, um, to see their names on the data, to validate their experiences. Uh, we saw that in Flint where people were holding up brown bottles of water and they were saying it's okay. And it, it, it it's so invalidating, right? Um, Residents need varied communication, email letters, door knocking, because, because we are on our computers every day. Uh, we assume that others are on their computers every day, and that is just not how the majority of people are receiving news or information. Um, so we need to be the eyes and the ears. We need to knock on doors. We need people that are designing either plans or research to really think about um, how to engage residents. Uh, because of planning that um, is out of reach, uh, these notifications and, um, and gentrifications, um, uh, gentrification is happening also at the same time, residents feel intentionally left out. So um, I am really aware, and I, I think other organizations also know that your actions could have an even, even deeper impact if they are not notified, they are not included. Um, it is a moment where people feel that they don't belong in their neighborhoods. And so it's really important to be purposeful and intent, you know, have intention to really include them, language barriers, job barriers, whatever it is that we need to really make that uh, a point of effort. Um, residents need support on sign-ons or letters of support when they are advocating. Um, to partner with organizations that have long-term trusted local relationships with residents um, because we have had people drop in. We call it parachuting in. They parachute in for six months or a year and then they're gone. And so we need consistency for residents to understand and to have, develop long-term relationships. Um, but residents also need autonomy uh, and to represent themselves in these, these struggles that they have with the city and the state and other um, entities. Um, in May, residents worked to downgrade zoning in Southwest Detroit that positively affected what kind of industry can come in or what they can do in this new um, downgraded zoning. For example, it'll cut down truck traffic and noise um, and what kind of companies can come onto the into this smaller corridor part of like north of Verner. Um, there's been another one also near McGraw, another uh, down zone, downgrading of the zoning. Um, and so that that was a very large concerted effort amongst, you know, organizations and residents um, talking to each other, educating each other and encouraging each other because um, most people don't want to go to a city council meeting. Um, they don't know what to say. They feel that they're going to, you know, not say the right thing. And so uh, it was a a beautiful outcome uh, of what of what this data gathering and effort can can lead to. This fall, also as a response to the 2019 dot collapse of the former Revere Copper and Brass site along the river, that had had potential uranium co contamination, um, led to the residents helping to pass a Detroit River Protection Ordinance. Um, that was another big movement that we saw that banded the residents together and. 
Um, it was also supported by the Community Action Plan for Healthy Environments, or CAFE, um, and other partners um, by, you know, writing letters. I think it does help when we have uh, names attached to some things and, you know, alongside with many, many residents um, attending, um, attending the meetings. So with, um, with all of that, you know, I can close by saying, we know that um, in, in this area that asthma is double and triple the rate um, for asthma in, of Michigan. So, um, you know, it is something that we all think about. Um, uh, one of the pictures that Catherine showed was in my backyard and you see the trucks lined up on both sides. Um, and, you know, because there's a bridge not, not even a mile from here and they are looking for locations that make it easier for them. Um, but it, it congests our, you know, our streets and our lungs. Um, so, so with that, I'll close with saying that um, um, we want research. Yes, we do. That asks opinions and engages them, engages residents. Um, that what they can see their faces and their names. They they want to own that that effort and and to to see um, see their struggle. You know, uh, documented um, and credentialed in ways that you know helps them. Um, and I think that when that happens, when, it, when we see that perfect um, ordinance making moment, it's so it's such a hopeful act for us that live in this condition all of the time. So with that, I'll close and thank you again for having me. Thank you so much to the panelists for three really engaging um, presentations from very different perspectives. And I think together, they really paint a picture not only of the, the science around um, particulate matter, but the human impacts um, a, a, of it. And, um, and I think what really comes through so, so clearly in this uh, set of presentations is the active engagement and constant engagement of community residents in pushing back um, to protect their own health um, and that of their, their neighborhoods. So thank you all for those presentations. We have a number of questions that have been coming in in the chat as you guys have been talking. Um, the first one is actually about Benton Harbor um, and lead, um, which of course that contamination is lead in water um, was rather than lead um, in, in, in the air. Um, but the question is, is really a regulatory question and it is about why did it take um, the EPA, why wasn't this discovered by the EPA sooner than it was? And I know none of you are um, involved in the regulatory end um, of this process, but I do wanna invite and just see if any of you would like to tackle that question. Well, I can't speak to the specifics of Benton Harbor, um, but I do know that from my experience dealing with regulatory agencies that they are not generally proactive. They let things go until there's a problem. And then it's, they tend to be very reactive. Um, and, you know, they tend to sort of assume the best. Um, we see this with the permitting process, uh, you know, along air pollution that, you know, we raise a lot of concerns and they tell us everything is going to be fine as they did with the Lantis plant. And then when it opens and it starts operating and the community is experiencing, you know, horrible odors, um, and then we find what the problem is. And so I can't speak specifically to Benton Harbor uh, situation, um, but I think that lead is something that is very widespread in our environment. We've known about the hazards for a very, very long time. And we haven't been as a society proactive in working to eliminate, you know, potential exposures. And so we continue to have these situations where, you know, there are lead pipes still out there and it's very, very costly and time consuming to replace them. And we haven't prioritized that. And so I think this is just a reflection of how um, we don't prioritize health um, and the expenses that it would take to protect human health in many different circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Tim or Raquel, do either of you want to add anything to that or? No, I just, it just goes back to, we need to monitor um, because I mean, it's just a, a big machine. And by the time 
it's also something that came up in a meeting with Eagle where they said, we need to see these three different quarter reports before we can do anything. And I'm thinking three, that's three quarters of a year. <laughs> so we need to be monitoring and understand um, what it is because that, that's just in their rule. So they, you know, it's what they work with and, um, and it can go longer if, if, if it measures low of one quarter, but we know it's there. So it, it just goes back to, we need to monitor and, and, and learn about these things. And um, yeah. Thank you. I, the next question really follows right on, I think both of your, your responses to the first, why are the efforts in these areas always reactionary rather than proactive? We seem to talk about these issues and the traumatic effects continue to affect our communities. Not so much a question maybe, um, I guess the first one is a question. Um, So I, I tend to think it's who's in office, you know, um, I think there's a lot of different angles, um, but, you know, um, if, if they are thinking about the environment and environmental justice and we are, you know, asking questions and, um, you know, before something happens, um, just the monitoring and implementation of the existing, you know, rules or even asking, do we have what we need? I can't believe that we just, in this year put in a Detroit River Protection Ordinance, like in Detroit, <laughs> like that seems ridiculous to me. You know, it's our it's our drinking water, you know? And so um, I think we need someone who's like uh, benchmarking and constantly asking questions and, and reviewing policy to see that we, it's in place. And if it's not in place to start that conversation. Thank you, Raquel. And Tim, I saw you unmuted. Did you want to say on that one? Yeah, I'll add in. I'm going to start by thanking uh, Catherine and Raquel for, for taking the first stab at these questions. They're much better answers than I would have been able to provide. They're, they're really good questions. And yeah, I guess I'm just going to echo the, you know, part of the point that Catherine made a few minutes ago to the first question is that it's really the framework in this country to be reactionary and not to be proactive. And it's not like this everywhere else, you know, uh, in Europe. It, it's a much more proactive regulatory framework. You can't just develop a product to sell to consumers without demonstrating that it will be safe and not cause harm. And, and we have much less in the way of, of safeguards from a regulatory perspective here in the U.S. Yeah, we talk about the precautionary principle in the U.S. Um, you have to prove that harm has been caused rather than, as Tim just pointed out, um, having uh, to prove that something is safe before you release it into the environment. The next question in the chat, this one's for you, Catherine. Uh, first, thanks for a great talk. Um, and wondering if there were any evaluations of air pollution exposures and health outcomes after the incinerators were, were closed. Well, I can speak for the Ecology Center that, you know, we were installing these monitors to evaluate what air pollution ex exposures might actually be um, when the incinerator closed. So we don't have, you know, we don't have data sort of comparing before and after. Um, and, um, and we don't have a good way to measure the health impact of, of that. And then that's, that's, that's a concern a lot of times that we have data about what air quality is but linking that to what actual health outcomes might be is a very difficult thing. We do know that in the area where the incinerator locate, is located, that that particular zip code or the zip codes surrounding that in central Detroit are among the, the highest zip codes for asthma hospitalization in the state. Um, if you look at the, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services report, I think it was 2016, um, that, that looks at, you know, Detroit was called the epicenter of asthma um, based on, you know, the highest zip codes, the six highest zip codes of the state being based in Detroit. And they, three of them were in the area immediately surrounding the incinerator. So I don't know what has changed after that, if we will see improvement. Um, it was, um, the incinerator was a major, in many ways, a major symbol of environmental racism for many reasons. Um, and, and it was just there as this awful polluting thing in the middle of the city, but it wasn't the largest polluter. Um, so I don't know how much of a, 
of a change we'll see in health and future studies, you know, that the state might do. Um, you know, and it was a surprise to us actually when we shut down the incinerator and looked around the city to see what else we should be looking at. We were really shocked to see that the Stellantis, which was formerly Fiat Chrysler assembly plant, was the, by far the major polluter and yet was sort of flying under the radar in terms of our understanding of its health impact and advocacy around it, which has changed. Um, so I, that's, I think, to answer your question, we don't have a lot of good data about after the incinerator closed. Thank you, Catherine. And I see we are at the end of our time. So I want to um, close first with an acknowledgement and thank you to Raquel, who put a link into the chat to a podcast um, that th talks about lead poisoning related to housing demolitions. Thank you, Raquel, for that resource. Um, and once again, just thanks to this incredible panel for sharing your time and your um, and your insights with us today um, and uh, echoing Barbara's um, uh, 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 post in the chat. Sorry, I was distracted by another one. Um, thanks to all of you for the really compelling work and for the work that you do um, to help promote um, environmental justice and um, uh, and and health equity. Um, so thank you all, and thanks, uh, Robin, for reposting uh, the link in the chat so everyone can see it. All right, take care, everyone. <laughs>